People are wired in a way that once they achieve a higher level of wealth or status than the average person, they typically come to one of two conclusions. The first is that their success is purely the result of their own efforts. They often overlook the role of luck and favorable circumstances. The second conclusion is that anyone else could have followed the same path, but laziness and a lack of knowledge keep most people from reaching a higher level. However, both of these viewpoints tend to lead to a sense of self-importance and a separation from less fortunate members of society. This separation and the desire to distance oneself from the common folk often manifest in building enormous houses, buying luxury cars, yachts, and other status symbols. The more primitive the society's development, the more blatant this display of wealth tends to be. But this didn't start yesterday, or even in the chaotic 1990s. The Neolithic Revolution, aside from introducing agricultural practices, disrupted the traditional way of life. Small, tribe-like groups of hunter-gatherers largely disappeared, while in regions favorable for farming, the population began to grow rapidly. As these populations began to produce surplus food, often more than needed for survival, it changed everything. In the past, when attacking another tribe of hunter-gatherers, people could only gain tools and items they could easily make themselves. Now, however, villages held substantial food reserves. A successful raid meant the chance to feed oneself without farming. However, as we might say in the 1990s, it was even more profitable and somewhat safer to offer protection services. This meant providing security for a fee, and if someone refused, they could be robbed instead. Some of these early gangsters did quite well and began passing down their status to their heirs. With this came a sense of their own importance and a separation from ordinary farmers. And since there were always people eager to build their fortune by being close to the powerful, this led to yet another interesting phenomenon. Various priests and religious figures created the concept of deifying authority. Yesterday's thug now became a sacred figure, supposedly having a connection to the divine. This made them immensely important, justifying their high status and practically eliminating any challenge from the common people who now saw themselves as mere mortals. On the other hand, if this rough and lengthy intro is drawing a parallel to the 90s, such deification allowed many smart sycophants among the priests to secure cushy positions by weaving the ruler into a religious narrative. In ancient Egypt, priests could simultaneously hold official government roles. However, divine status also demanded some material justification beyond just fancy jewelry and clothing. In fact, as early as the Copper Age, megaliths started to become widespread, Structures made of massive stones that can be categorized as early prototypes of temples and burial sites for rulers and other powerful individuals. The tradition of building temples and monuments to honor historical figures persists even today. During the Middle Ages and into modern times, the markers of status became palaces, castles, and estates. In ancient times, however, burials played just as significant, if not a greater, role. Flaunting one's status has been valued more than money throughout almost all of history. In areas where stone was scarce, huge mounds, kurgans, were erected over the graves of nobles. If sandstone deposits were available nearby, the mounds were often covered with stone blocks. Such armored kurgans frequently get misrepresented as pyramids in dubious articles and online posts. In regions where civilization truly took hold, we see the emergence of actual pyramids, ziggurats, it's important to understand that their shape was not chosen by chance. It's the simplest form for building a massive structure since its sloping sides facilitate easier transportation of blocks. Plus, it's the most stable shape because most of the mass is at the base, forgiving many imperfections in the blocks. Simply put, the pyramid shape was dictated by the primitive construction techniques of the time. Building a massive structure as a cube or cylinder would have been beyond the capabilities of the Egyptians and other early civilizations. Limestone pyramids were preceded by less reliable constructions made of mud bricks. It's also worth noting that the theory suggesting the blocks were made of some kind of concrete is unfounded. Modern researchers even know the exact quarries where the blocks were cut. In fact, the Pyramid of Khafre is located near an ancient quarry. Its base is essentially a natural rock formation that was shaped as needed. Claims about the extraordinary precision of the block's geometry are also exaggerated. Gaps were often filled with gypsum mortar during construction. The blocks themselves are frequently portrayed as gigantic and immovable. However, we need to understand that the average block of the Great Pyramid of Khufu weighs about two and a half tons. 
with limestone density around 2,800 kilograms per cubic meter, a two and a half ton block would be a cube with 90 centimeter sides. Depending on the source, the largest block of this pyramid weighed 15 tons, equivalent to a cube with sides just under two and a half meters. A typical bedroom in a modest apartment has an area of 15 square meters. With a ceiling height of two and a half meters, its volume is 37 and a half cubic meters. A stone of that size would weigh over 100 tons, twice the average weight of a Stonehenge block. However, in later antiquity, people moved stones weighing many hundreds of tons, like the megaliths in the Temple of Jupiter. Before we dive into how this was done in ancient times, we need to consider what weight a single person can move without levers, using only muscle power. If you look it up, you'll easily find videos of strong men pulling airplanes weighing over 120 tons or trains weighing 200 tons. Of course, you can argue about modern wheels and bearings, but it's hard to deny that dragging something is easier than lifting it, and rolling it is about 50 times easier than dragging. For instance, pushing an empty rail car weighing 35 tons is within the capabilities of an average man. However, lifting 100 kilograms overhead, which is 350 times lighter, is a task few can manage. Let me give an example from the time of Catherine the Great, taken from an article on anthropogenesis.ru. To construct the pedestal for Peter the Great's monument, a stone weighing 1,250 tons had to be transported. That's one and a half times heavier than the largest stone block of antiquity. Special grooves were made for this, and metal spheres were placed inside, allowing the stone to roll. With friction minimized, moving 1,250 tons required just over one ton of force, handled by two manual capstans. The force was amplified using pulley systems, increasing it to 50 tons, or about 1 23rd of the stone's mass, enough to move it. All the work was done by 64 people, and this method was likely known since antiquity. It's worth noting that a typical hemp rope, known since ancient times, with a cross-section of about 5 centimeters, can hold a load of up to 120 kilonewtons, or about 12 tons. Wood, on average, withstands compression of about 500 kilograms per square centimeter. In ancient Egypt, there wasn't much need for complex systems with grooves and spheres. Blocks could be transported using simple rollers, where logs acted as rails, or even with sleds alone. According to Herodotus, a massive road was built for transporting the pyramid blocks. As depicted on ancient frescoes, 172 men were pulling a 60-ton statue of the nomarch Jehutihotep II on sleds. Although 1,500 years later, the Greeks would likely consider this method barbaric and inefficient. The Red Sea papyri from Khufu's era, the 3rd millennium BCE, describe a crew of 40 people transporting several blocks by boat. Each round trip, loading, transporting 12 kilometers, unloading and delivering the blocks, took five days. This means one crew could supply about 120 blocks per month. Essentially, if you place a stone under a heavy block, breaking ground contact, even one person can move it by rotating and repositioning it. Recently, an experiment showed two researchers moving 25-ton concrete blocks together by leveraging the center of gravity. Similarly, by manipulating the center of gravity with ropes, 18 people transported an actual Moai statue on Easter Island. Now, if the Egyptians knew how to use ropes, rollers, sleds, and levers, the classical Mediterranean civilizations took things much further when it came to moving giant stones. By the 5th century BCE, the first cranes appeared. Thanks to pulleys, they provided up to a five-fold advantage when lifting heavy loads. We start seeing vertical winches and horizontal capstans. Combined with pulleys, these allowed a person to lift or pull six times more weight than just using ropes alone. In other words, where 172 Egyptians were dragging a 60-ton statue on sleds, just 30 Greeks with winches could handle the same job. If you want to dig deeper into how simple tools made it possible to roll not only round but even square objects, we have the 10 books on architecture by Vitruvius. This Roman architect and engineer lived in the 1st century BCE, and his descriptions can also be found depicted in ancient frescoes. In fact, Vitruvius's texts and diagrams became the foundation for Renaissance and early modern engineering. His works were essentially used as a textbook until the 19th century, one of the fascinating mechanisms from antiquity, still in use during the Middle Ages and early modern period, was the treadwheel crane. It's basically a large drum where a person walked inside, like a hamster in a wheel. 
Thanks to this device, a person's strength was multiplied by about 70 times, allowing them to perform the work needed to lift three and a half metric tons just by taking a leisurely walk. The only catch was that to lift a load 10 meters high, they'd need to walk 140 meters. The largest treadwheel cranes could fit up to four people and had a lifting capacity of around 11 metric tons. Now, to raise a long stone, like an obelisk or a column weighing several hundred tons, special structures known as lifting towers were used in antiquity and later periods. However, as demonstrated by one modern enthusiast, with just a few counterweights and by sliding wooden beams underneath, he managed to lift an eight and a half ton stone horizontally without any winches or pulleys. Modern people often marvel at the achievements of recent times, yet we tend to forget that the core principles of mechanics geometry and mathematics were already established back in antiquity. We're merely applying the knowledge that took our ancestors centuries of practical experiments and thousands of hours of thought to develop. In essence, the Renaissance was nothing more than a moment when Europe caught up to the level where society had a renewed need for ancient knowledge. And since many of these works were preserved, it sparked a developmental leap that essentially shaped the world we live in today. Could ancient people really move those massive stone blocks? For me, the answer is obvious. Today's society relies more and more on machines, and with this increasing automation, we're drifting further away from understanding our own capabilities and moving further from objective reality.